All right. Good evening. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This lecture is a memoriam of Herb Robertstein. Herb Robertstein was a longtime professor at IWP and director of the Office to Counter Soviet Disinformation at the US Information Agency. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Dr. Jack Ziak. Dr. Ziak is a consultant in the fields of intelligence, counterintelligence, counter deception, and national security affairs. He has served over five decades as a company president and as a senior intelligence officer and senior executive in the office of the Secretary of Defense and in the Defense Intelligence Agency, with long experience in counterintelligence, hostile deception, counter deception, strategic intelligence, weapons proliferation intelligence, and intelligence education. He received his PhD in Russian history from Georgetown University, is a graduate of the National War College, and is a recipient of numerous defense and intelligence awards and citations. He is an adjunct professor at the Institute of World Politics and has taught at the National War College, National Intelligence University, Georgetown University, and the George Washington University, and lectures on intelligence, military affairs, and security issues throughout the US and abroad. Dr. Ziak, welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Hannah. And welcome to all the people attending the Herb Bernstein Memorial Lecture. Um, this presentation focuses on Natalie, Grant, Natalie Grant's story and how she came to write about Soviet political warfare and the difficulties she faced in doing so. I will not go into the book's substance uh, in any detail. That's for you, the reader, to explore. And I strongly encourage you to do just that. This session is for Natalie. And uh, I will touch upon several of the items in her book, but primarily we're gonna talk, we're, we will be talking about how Natalie put this together. I'm going to do this in several segments. First, we're gonna talk about a little bit about Herb Ermerstein and Natalie. We're going to talk about Natalie and her career. We'll next move on to Natalie and her husband, Richard Braga. Natalie was also known as Natalie Grant Braga. We'll talk about Natalie and her husband at the Hoover Institution. Then we'll move on to Natalie and her husband with the US intelligence community. We'll talk about Natalie as a mentor to a couple of generations of intelligence officers. And then finally, I'll do a very short summation. But first, about Herb Romerstein. Herb was a dear friend to me, to IWP, and to some of the people who may be viewing us today. Herb and Natalie were very close. Uh, it's from Herb's copy of Natalie's draft of disinformation uh, that the published copy by Leopolis Press under Professor Horakevich uh, came out a very short time ago. Herb and Natalie discussed and argued over many of the deception and disinformation operations and definitions now ensconced in that book. Natalie and Herb were possessed of very similar critical minds. I, I viewed them both as natural born counterintelligence officers. Uh, they employed, employed a, an exceptional critical judgment, deep research into that which is hidden and was meant to be hidden. Herb was part of that small core of intelligence officers who regularly trekked to Natalie's mountain retreat to discuss, yes, disinformation, deception, and the operations of the KGB and its predecessors. Uh, she, she and Herb, from the very first day, well, she, from the very first days of Bolshevism, uh, dove into these problems and are now part of the tradecraft uh, of so many contemporary intelligence warfare practitioners. And I don't mean just the overseas bad actors. Okay, now let's move into Natalie and her career. Uh, 
if you look at the book, you will see in the forward that I wrote that she was born in Tsarist Russia, right at the turn of the 20th century. In fact, in 1901, she was a first-hand observer of the Russian Revolution and the Civil War. So she saw these things up close, and she wrote what she wrote about was was uniquely placed. She was uniquely placed for doing just that. She was a translator for the Hoover Relief Commission, run by mostly State Department Foreign Service officers, one of whom, by the name of Grant, she married. The marriage didn't last too long, but when he left the scene, she stayed on as a State Department employee, eventually becoming a Foreign Service officer. When she retired from the U.S. Foreign Service, she became a member of the Foreign Service Officers Association. She was witness to much of the directed information operations of the early years of the Cheka, the Agpu. These were the predecessors to what was later known as the KGB, today's FSB and SBR. And she was stationed for a number of years at Riga, the U.S. legation at Riga, Latvia. Now, having been born in the Baltic country, she was able to migrate back there with her mother. Her father died during the Civil War. They escaped to southern Russia early in the Civil War, which was a mistake, but they didn't know it was going to turn out that way. And eventually, she was able to bring her mother back to the Baltics. And it was at Riga, which housed the U.S. legation, in the interwar period between World War I and World War II. Uh, and we had no diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union until 1933, following the election of uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Riga was an intelligence listening post. In fact, she wrote another book that never got published, similar to her book, Disinformation, titled Window on Russia. And that was about the Riga legation. It was there that she was first exposed to deception, disinformation, and what we now know as directed information. We had attaches, the British had military and uh, MI6 intelligence officers there. We may have had ONI officers and maybe some military intelligence officers, but we did not have a centralized intelligence structure the way the Brits did. So we were the recipients of a lot of information coming from British intelligence, who were our allies in World War I. A lot of this information was directed information, and it was meant to do several things, among them to uh, prevent any Western invasion of the Soviet Union. And that was really a projection on the part of the Soviets. There was nobody who was going to invade the Soviet Union from the West. They were prostate from, from World War I. Uh, and so that was one of the themes that the Soviets propagated through their control mechanisms coming into Riga. We were the recipients of much of that intelligence from the Brits. I have a number of documents that I received from Natalie uh, on those intelligence reports, and they generally propagated two things. One was that the Soviet Union was too weak to do any damage to Western Europe, or two, the Soviet Union was too powerful for any damage being done to it by any presumed invasion coming from the West. And you see these themes in much of the information that was received by British intelligence and US State Department and military intelligence at that time. So she was especially equipped to see firsthand what was happening. Also, while she was there, she trained a number of our early Russian specialists in the State Department. And then later on, she became a full-fledged State Department Foreign Service officer. So she understood the strategic purport of deception and disinformation. She also understood the nature of the information coming from the emigration and defectors, early defectors. Now we have to remember that Europe 
was in bad shape. And when much of the immigration migrated to Western Europe, there were no jobs for them. And one of the things that that lent itself to was the selling of information. Many of these people had a background in military affairs and or intelligence affairs, and some of them generated paper mills. Okay, so some of it was for profit. Some of it was where these immigrants and defectors uh, were re-recruited by the Soviet Union, and they were vectors for information, vectors to the point where even books were generated. And that's where the term books for idiots, I think, first cropped up. Uh, a number of these came from a, uh, a former foreign ministry officer by the name of Vigari Biesodovsky, who produced a number of books. Later on, it was judged that he was recruited by the Soviets. They left them in place. And some of these generated a lot of confusion and even affected foreign policy and, and other defense policies on the part of uh, Western governments. Now, these Western governments being targeted were the British, the French, the Germans, the Poles, the Baltic governments, Finland, et cetera. And, and so a, a whole stream of information entered into the, the um, intelligence operations and intelligence flow going to those areas. Um, let me move into now Natalie and Richard. Uh, while she was benefiting from her experience as a foreign service officer, and later was moved to Paris. From Paris, she moved on to the US Embassy in London after the Germans invaded. Uh, another figure crops into her life, and that's Richard Braga. Uh, his real name was Antony Jerzy Nitschbrisky. And Richard was a Polish intelligence officer. He was very, very active in operations against the Soviet Union, especially following the failed Soviet invasion of Poland in 1920, the Russo-Polish War, the Soviet-Polish War. That army, the Red Army, was really moving through Poland onto West German, onto Germany, uh, to link up with the German Bolsheviks, the German Communists. And fortunately, the Poles prevailed in that battle. Now, Richard Draga was a counterintelligence officer on the Polish general staff serving under uh, the then president. And he countered in his operations one of the first major strategic deception operations called the Trust. Um, the Trust was a strategic provocation in which a notional opposition was created to do several things, to penetrate and control the opposition in Russia against the Soviet Union, to penetrate and negate the opposition of the Tsarist forces that had migrated to Western Europe, first through the Baltic and then in, into Western Europe and to feed spurious information into the files of Western intelligence. And in this case, the French, the Brits, and the Germans, and the Poles as well. Piłsudski, the Polish president, whose specialty was in logistics, had a nose for this. He, he also knew Zerzhinsky from the underground period when Poland was occupied by the Russians, the Germans, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So he understood Zerzhinsky. He understood counterintelligence. He understood provocation. He did a counter operation via Richard Draga in through trust channels to test to make sure that the intelligence coming from them was either legitimate or nonsense. And it turned out that it was nonsense. And he ordered then the discontinuance of any cooperation of Polish intelligence with the trust network. And then the trust was folded up publicly by Stalin. Okay, later on in 
the interwar period, he ran, Braga ran operations against the NKVD. Some of them are so successful, but there is suspicion that he was able to penetrate even into Yezhov, the head of the NKVD in the mid to late 1930s, before the ascendancy of Berea as head of the, KG, of the NKVD. And there is strong suspicion among some sources, you won't find any of this in writing any place, this is intelligence. And intelligence coming from people like Draga and the Poles and others. I learned this from my, through my association with Natalie and my long association with fellow intelligence officers, especially mentors of mine who were in the counterintelligence staff of the Central Intelligence Agency and World War II officers in my own organization who were familiar with the stuff. So there's a feeling that maybe even Yezhov was compromised by an operation that Braga ran. Now, the connection to Vraga comes when the Soviets invade Poland from the east, Germans invade from the west. Remember, it was a joint operation. There was an alliance between the two. And the Polish government went into exile, and Vraga went with them. And it was in London that Vraga met Natalie. Long story short, they fell in love and married. Okay, and that was quite a team. There was a woman who, from her State Department career, learned about the Soviet Union and also her own presence, her own uh, childhood in Tsarist Russia. And Richard Draga, who was the quintessential Polish counterintelligence officer. Now, after the war, uh, obviously, Draga could not go back to Poland. He was an enemy of the state. And Natalie Grant, Natalie Grant Draga, and Richard moved to the United States. And that'll be the next part of my discussion here. That's Natalie and Richard at the Hoover Institute. Now the Hoover Institute was quite an unusual and still is quite an unusual organization. It was the repository of the files of the Paris Okrana. The Paris Okrana was the major outstation of the central Okrana of the Ministry of Interior the Tsarist police. Now, the Ukraina was a counterintelligence agency. It was not a foreign intelligence agency. It, it ran counterintelligence operations. These entailed strategic deception, disinformation, penetration, provocation, the setting up of notional opposition, et cetera, which is the way they controlled up until 1917, uh, the Bolshevik Party, the Menshevik Party, the SRs, the Socialist Revolutionaries, uh, the Jewish Bund, uh, even the Constitutional Democrats, etc. They knew how to do counterintelligence. Counterintelligence is not checking off, signing the safes. Counterintelligence is, is not doing background investigations. Counterintelligence in an organization like the Okrana is characteristic of the counterintelligence state whose purpose is to penetrate the local society, the local population, and prevent it from overturning the government. In the case of the Okrana, that was the Tsarist government. Now, the organizations that have penetrated were precisely the organization, or one of them, that precisely came to power. They were penetrated by the Okrana. They knew how to fight the Okrana. The Okrana knew how to penetrate them. So when the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917, they hit the road running. They were like Herb Bromerstein and Natalie Grant, natural born counterintelligence officers. And they immediately started the same kind of, kind of operations that the Ukraina ran against them. Okay, and this is, this is where the files of the Ukraina, Paris Ukraina, come into play. Uh, it was known as the the outstation of the St. Petersburg Okrana, later during World War I, the Petrograd Okrana, and it was basically a foreign counterintelligence presence. It had sub-branches that spread even to the United States, but its purpose was counterintelligence. Those files were found their way to the Hoover archive. Not only the files, but emigres, from 
Soviet Russia, defectors from Soviet Russia, not the whole interwar period. So both of them working at the Hoover Institute, new staffers like Bertram Wolf, uh, originally a communist, uh, who later wrote books at the Hoover Institute. Alexander Kerensky, the president of the provisional government, landed at the Hoover Institute. Vitos Svorokovsky, uh, people like Boris Nikolaevsky, a Menshevik. So this gives you a sense of, of the, the kind of population that ended up at the Hoover Institute. These are the people that Natalie and Richard rubbed elbows with. It was a very, very interesting period and a very interesting group of people, ex-Mensheviks, ex-Bolsheviks, ex-SRs, et cetera. Uh, people like um, uh, Richard Starr was there as well. Richard was a friend of mine. He knew Natalie, he knew Richard, uh, Richard Draga. Uh, Richard Starr was a Marine Corps intelligence colonel in the reserves. Uh, he understood all of this. In fact, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the new Russian Federation government put strong pressure on Hoover to get a hold of the Okhrana archive. I don't think that happened. Um, so they, they were very well placed to continue the kind of work that ultimately resulted in the book disinformation that we're dealing with here today. And Natalie just kept plowing into all of that material. Her files grew. And eventually they moved from Hoover and landed in Northern Virginia in Northern Loudoun County. She and Richard built a house on Catoctin Mountain which was about two miles in from the Potomac River. And that's where I first dealt with Natalie after being introduced to her by a Central Intelligence Agency friend. In fact, I mined all of that material at Hoover for my book, Chakisti, The History of the KGB. And I'll admit, over which Natalie had some critical influence. Okay, having said that, uh, let's move on to Natalie and Richard in the U.S. intelligence community. And this is where most of this starts coming together. Actually, the connection to U.S. intelligence began well before they moved to Northern Virginia. Um, I, I knew that people like Raymond Rocca, the research director and deputy chief of the counterintelligence staff, uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. Uh, Ray would visit her. Ray was a very good friend of mine. He, like Natalie, was one of my mentors going back to the 1960s. Um, but the relationship with Hoover actually predated that. I think it began uh, under the OSS in London uh, back during the war years. And that continued. So it, it really was where she and Richard helped to vector the counterintelligence staff to the plethora of literature from the immigration. Uh, the White Army Officer Organization called the ROBs, uh, the Mensheviks and the SRs, uh, uh, the Trusts, and on and on. They, they worked very, very closely with the counterintelligence staff, so close indeed that uh, Richard Draga was taken, taken on trips by the Central Intelligence Agency to allied counterpart intelligence services in France and Great Britain, where he lectured on such things as deception, disinformation, and especially provocation. Provocation being the vehicle which is you know, usually misunderstood in the United States. Uh, you know, we, we think of sting operations, but it had a much larger strategic dimension than sting operations. These were strategic deception operations, the trust being the first one we, we have on the books. I might add uh, a little bit of a personal aside here. Uh, I had been to the Soviet Union back in the 70s uh, on an official business, or diplomatic passport. And that was basically very, very closely covered, obviously, by KGB surveillance. 
And it wasn't until after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1996, after I retired from my DIA job, that I went on a private trip with two other former intelligence officers of CIA and the Canadian Intelligence Service, the, uh, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Service, Counterintelligence Service. And there's a long story behind that, but we visited the KGB Museum. We had special entree into that. And when I came in, I was, we were told we could bring our cameras. When we got to the museum, we were told we couldn't. And so they left outside. This was before digital photography. And when I walked in, the first thing that hit us was a huge organization chart of the trust. There it was. And it's still being used in Russian intelligence schools for, uh, I understand for both the FSB and the SVR, the FSB being the counterintelligence service, the SVR being the Foreign Intelligence Service, still being used as a training vehicle for a paradigmatic strategic, strategic deception operation. So the work that they did with CIA ended in a huge collection that now reposits, I think it does, still reposit in the historical intelligence collection of the Central Intelligence Agency Library a whole volume of unclassified materials on interwar newspapers, articles, interviews with the immigration, with the ROBs, uh, with the uh, uh, organizations that were penetrated by the Soviet Union in that interwar period. A whole collection on the trust is in that collection. And Natalie and Richard were among a number of consultants that made that happen. And that's a gold mine. Unfortunately, even though it's unclassified, it's still very difficult for private researchers to get to. They, she and Natalie, or she and her husband, consulted consistently on numerous cases and their, their deep grasp of Soviet intelligence operations uh, that leavened the ICs, the intelligence community's understanding of strategic deception. And it was not a particular easy, particularly easy thing to do because there was an awful lot of opposition precisely to uh, admitting that we could be deceived. I knew that from a long personal history and working issues of strategic deception. In fact, the the lines were so starkly drawn that there were believers and unbelievers. And I think there, numerically, there were probably more unbelievers in the effect and the efficacy of strategic deception. Uh, whenever in some of the various interagency uh, activities that I was involved in over decades, invariably when you came up with a possibility of deception and directed information, it was labeled sick think by certain elements of the intelligence community. It took a long time to overcome that. And it basically wasn't until the 1980s, with a lot of opposition, that you had the late 80s, that you had the creation of a um, foreign denial and deception committee at the national level. It was first housed in CIA, and then when the, the uh, Director of National Intelligence was created following 2001, it was housed in that organization. And I don't know how much of that is left, but the, the resistance to admit the admission of deception as it affected deception and as it affected um, foreign uh, public communications, et cetera. Uh, is, is still a very, very sensitive issue. Not as sensitive as it was for, especially following the 2016 controversies. Um, so Natalie was introduced to me in the late 1960s. At that point, I was on the staff of the Defense Intelligence School. I was responsible for all Soviet instruction that occurred there. The Defense Intelligence School was created out of the old Naval Intelligence School in the same facility down in Anacostia, which has been replaced by a metro station, I think on the Green Line. 
And um, uh, Ray Rocca and the Central Intelligence Agency helped our instruction by providing speakers. And Rocca at one point said, I have a very interesting woman whose roots go all the way back before the revolution. You should try to arrange to have your attaches, the attache course and your general intelligence course, the entry level course for civilian intelligence officers, et cetera. You should have her speaking to these people. And it happened. And that's where I met Natalie and from which developed a very close relationship and a mentor type relationship. This is when Herb Rowenstein met her as well. And a whole cadre of people, uh, both in the two intelligence committees, the Senate and the House, in DOD, in CIA, and elsewhere in the service intelligence organizations, and also, I believe, in the State Department as well. Uh, so Natalie entered into a little group of people um, that she mentored over a period of years. In fact, she she willed me some of her papers, not all of them, but willed some of her papers. And here again is where Herb Rormerstein came into play. At one point after Natalie died, and I was informed that I was in her will for some of her papers, I was also informed that we better get out to her house and clean them out because the house is about to be sold and everything has got to go. So Herb Rommerstein, his wife, Pat, my wife, Carol, and myself spent a whole day going through two floors of papers. Unfortunately, many of them were in the basement, which was compromised by dampness, and many of the papers were unusual. But we did manage to get several cartons of of papers out of there, pile them in the, into the backs of our cars and delivered them to my house in Gray Falls here, where I'm speaking from right now. Um, that, that's just a little aside as to the nature of the relationship. Getting back into her role as mentor of counterintelligence and dis disinformation to several generations of US intelligence officers, um, several of whom were affiliated with IWP, people like uh, Herb himself, who taught at IWP, David Thomas, who still teaches there, Kenny Graffereed, who used to teach there and is Professor Emeritus, and whom I think we just saw a few days ago in a presentation. There were numerous visits to her house, and, and these I look back on with fond, fond memories. Uh, visits with Ray Rocca, with Ray and Herb, with her and many others. We introduced many other people to Natalie. All of us took a special interest in trying to get her books published, her manuscripts published. I, I hate to say it, we were singularly unsuccessful. Nobody was interested in disinformation. It just wasn't a popular topic. Uh, we even had a senior editor of Random House in one of their, their logo publishing houses uh, working hard himself to make it happen. It never happened. That's why we're so gratified that Marek Horikevich, Professor Horikevich, was successful in, in getting it published through his press, the Leopolis Press. And I strongly encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, Natalie was a very gracious hostess. In addition to quite a talker and quite a tutor, uh, and, and you could carry on arguments and discussions with her. Uh, the, the, there was no problem there. You, you could have vigorous, vigorous disagreements and everything went fine. Uh, she was from a period in history where truth was critical and you get at it by dispute. Uh, but she was a gracious hostess. Uh, for instance, every time we visited, uh, she would bake something. She would have cakes. Uh, with um, sugared violets in the icing, jams from her berries, fruits from her trees. In fact, my wife Carol and our then young son Jack would roam freely through her gardens, uh, picking fruit and berries to take home. Natalie had basically created a classic Russian dacha in northern Loudoun County, Virginia. 
uh, these sessions were very, very similar to the literary circles of Tsarist Russia. And that's because of Natalie. She was fluent in a number of languages. She knew Russian literature from the Golden Age, from the Silver Age. She knew uh, you know, the Turgenev, Tolstoy, Pushkin, Lermontov, Dostoevsky. But we didn't talk about those people. Uh, we talked about the Ukraina, Lenin, Zerzhinsky, Stalin, Yagoda, Maria, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and yes, even Gorbachev. And she was very, very wary about Gorbachev. She didn't trust him. Anyone who was formed in that system, she knew to be a disinformant, a disinformer, a deceiver. And you will find her views in the book, Disinformation. She understood Soviet political warfare and its assault on the West. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, she understood that the residuals of that never went away. In fact, there was, she was the first to understand that there was never a decommunization of the Soviet Union. To do a decommunization of the Soviet Union, you'd have to get rid of two things. First, the party, and more important, the KGB. The party they got rid of, in a way, but they never got rid of the KGB. She understood that well, meaning all the techniques of the decades of Soviet uh, provocation, disinformation, strategic disinformation, strategic uh, deception, and so forth, feints, ruses, uh, all of this had its own vocabulary. And she was a tutor, not only to me, but so many other people in, in learning that vocabulary and using it as the Soviets did. And it was part of the vocabulary of the counterintelligence state. Uh, she understood that political warfare assault on the West never really ended. She also understood that the roots of deception go far back, not only to the KGB, the Cheka, and the Ukraina, but all the way back to the Mongol period, the Mongol yoke in Russian history, the deep years of Russian history, going back to the 1200s. And the influence there was basically cynic. The Sino, the Chinese influence was paramount. Mongols had Chinese intelligence officers in their entourage. And one of the things that were characteristic of Mongol operations, where they ruled the world from the gates of Vienna all the way to the Sea of Okhotsk, was deception, ruse, psychological warfare. That period of Mongol rule over Tsarist uh, Russia had a very profound impact on the way the Soviets and the Tsarist predecessors did intelligence and viewed counterintelligence. Want to get some of the roots of that? Read Sun Tzu. He understood intelligence. This is the pedigree that she understood as well. So she knew it wasn't only characteristic of Tsarist and Soviet Russia. It had a deeper history. Okay, in summation, and we'll leave some time for questions. This information finally made it into print almost two decades after passing, after her passing. This information went through many drafts. She never stopped working on it. It was only after she started losing her eyesight that the drafting stopped. She was legally blind several years before she died in uh, 2001. She was legally blind. But her blindness, I think, made her memory and her mind even more acute. Even in those last years, the, right before she died, she was very, very sharp, especially sharp. And she wanted to probe our thinking and our understanding, people like her, Ray Rocca and others, uh, probe our understanding of what was happening after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And she always had a warning. Now, thanks to Professor Horkevich and his Leopolis Press, we have the product that you see before us. Um, 
Its lengthy workup and gestation, however, had an influence far beyond what she had expected. I don't think she would have dreamt that uh, she would have left such a legacy behind and that she hoped for in getting published while she was still with us. But thank goodness it's out there. And I encourage you to take advantage of it and look at the cases that she developed. Many of these cases you will not see in print elsewhere. Other of the cases um, have been revisited and there's still controversy going on over several of them, including the Zinoviev letter in the 1920s, uh, the trust, the Soviets and then the Russians published several versions of operations of the trust. Among the things that Natalie willed to me was an original, one of the first books uh, that she and others labeled Books for Idiots. And the title of that was Three Stolitsy, Three Capitals. And it was written by a, an emigre by the name of Boris Shulgin, who was in the uh, Tsarist Duma before the revolution. Shulgin was an anti-Soviet, but he was taken in by the trust and invited to come back in. The trust was really a complete creation. It was phony from the get-go. It was a notional structure, a fake structure. Talk about fake news. This was a fake opposition organization. They didn't want to arrest Shulgin. They want to use Shulgin as a vehicle for preferring a deceptive message on the Soviet Union. So through trust networks, he went through an underground tour of what was then known as Leningrad, Moscow, and Kiev, three Stolitsy, three capitals. And on his way out, the Agpu offered to help him with the writing of the book, and they vetted the book. I have a copy of the original Russian of that. It's a prized possession. And uh, this was one of the first examples, of, actually, I would consider the first example of books for idiots, okay? Um, let me conclude by saluting this remarkable lady and revering her memory. And I would only say one more thing. Rest in peace, dear Natalie, and rest in peace, Herb. It was fortunate that you knew each other and you interacted and left a legacy for all of us to benefit from. And now I want to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take some questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ziak. Um, yes, if you have questions, please feel free to comment in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We do have a few coming in. Um, the first question I have for you is, what was Natalie's primary motivation? For example, the anti-communism or American democracy, liberty, or both? Okay, well, I think that's a good question. Her primary motivation was she was a Russian patriot. And my information may be sketchy on the early years of her life. She didn't share very much of that. Uh, I think a number of her relatives uh, who may still be around, uh, would know a little more on that, but I think her father was a czarist magistrate. And uh, so there was, there was a, a reason for her attitude. She also saw up close the ravages of the Civil War. She saw the cost of communism. Uh, mass murder was part of the ethic if you could call it that, of the communist ideology. Uh, she knew that people like Zerzhinsky were, were mass murderers. She knew that Stalin was a math, mass murderer. Uh, these were psychologically twisted people. And you know, Lenin, uh, Lenin's famous quote, you can't make an omelet, i.e. the new society of communism. We had to first go through socialism. This is what still startles me today about the revival of socialism and the belief that you can create a perfect society, a utopia, uh, without breaking eggs. And that, that was Lenin's comment. You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. 
Well, the eggs are human beings. And after the Soviet Union collapsed and a number of very solid researchers started putting together the cost of all that, uh, we're talking even by the account of a former member of the Soviet Politburo, the cost of that in the Soviet Union itself, not counting China or North Vietnam, or, uh, well, Vietnam now, or Korea, or Cuba, or Venezuela, or Nicaragua, the cost of the Soviet Union to the Soviet Union alone was anywhere between 40 and 60 million people. This is uh, Alexander Yakovlev giving these figures. So she saw that up close. She saw what it had done to uh, the people of the Soviet Union, of, of her beloved Russia. And that affected her. And when she became an American citizen, there was a new loyalty where she had to protect, she felt she had to protect her new country against that threat, which never went away. And uh, I, I think that accounted for it. Plus she was a researcher. She was a scholar in the best sense of that term, multilingual. Her, her house was loaded with French books, German books, Russian books. Uh, English books, and she was fluent in all of them. In fact, her English diction was very, very precise because of her attention to language and the importance of language and the meaning of words. This is what upset her so much about deception and disinformation because it was polluting the language. When you pollute the language, you pollute minds. And this was one of her primary motivations. Now, I think you'll see that coming through in, in her uh, uh, rendition of the accounts of so many of the disinformation and deception operations in Soviet history. Thank you. Another attendee question here. Um, did, she, did Natalie analyze the activities of the KJB and the Stasi in Western Germany? Did they in return try to spy on her? Well, I don't know that she was that active in looking at contemporary operations, say in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, before the collapse of, of the Warsaw Pact and then the collapse of the Soviet Union. But she, she would check in on them to see the continuities. For instance, um, after, let's see, in the, when Putin became head of the KGB in the 1990s, uh, in the late 1990s, before he became president of the Russian Federation. She was very conscious of his pedigree and very conscious that he had served in Dresden, Germany. Now, she and others were very suspicious of the identification of Putin as a foreign intelligence officer. She and others were convinced that he was from the internal organs the old second chief directorate, which was the heart of the KGB. And that's the heart of the FSB today. So if he was from the second chief directorate and not from foreign intelligence, her question was, what was he doing in Dresden, Germany? Now, he didn't need to be there to control the East Germans. The East Germans were more communist than the Soviets. Uh, I visited the Stasi offices after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and these people, the Stasi, were, were just fixed on the KGB. They considered themselves in many respects to be the 16th Republic. Remember, the Soviet Union comprised 15 Union Republics. I think they were in competition with Bulgaria for thinking that they should be the 16th Republic of, of the Soviet Union. That's how pro-KGB and pro-Soviet they were. Uh, so she knew that little bit. Her focus was primarily on the past. She wanted to preserve all of that information and get that information out, which didn't make it very much into Western literature on the Soviet Union. And in fact, it wasn't until the late 70s and early 80s that you saw books being published on the KGB. The attitude of many academics was not, that's not territory we want to touch. Other academics thought that you couldn't write about the KGB unless you had classified information. That simply wasn't true. That's why I mentioned all of the kind of work she did in helping the intelligence community 
build those collections on the operations that occurred between the war and after the war. For instance, one of the things she knew was that operatives from the trust, i.e. czarist officers, former czarist officers and former white officers, the white army was created after the collapse of czarist Russia, and they fought the, Bol fought the Bolsheviks in the Civil War, um, that many of those officers who's, who had been recruited and compromised by the Cheka and then the Agpu and then the NKVD uh, remained in Western Europe. They kept them there. They were picked up by Nazi Germany. And then after World War II, we picked them up in the Army's counterintelligence corps and the new CIA. And so trust operatives whom she and her husband had identified were still being used unwittingly by the Western intelligence communities, including the United States. So it was that kind of interest in West Germany, et cetera, that, that she exhibited. But she wanted that the truth of that information, the truth of the language, the truth of these deception operations and the fixation of the intelligence and counterintelligence services of the Soviet Union on deception. Can you please discuss whether there were any specific congressmen and senators that worked with slash helped Natalie and Richard? That I don't know. I, I have a suspicion that she and or her husband may have sat in in conversations uh, under the sponsorship of their CIA friends, but I don't know that for sure. I know that they did that throughout the history of uh, uh, the Cold War with other defectors where they appeared before the Senate Intelligence, uh, uh, not the Senate Intelligence, this was before we created the Senate and uh, House Committees on Intelligence, but before the Armed Services Committees in the during the Cold War period. You see, you can, you can access some of these uh, visits where their uh, presentations to the Armed Services Committees uh, ended up being printed testimony. People like Rosvorov and, and numerous other defectors. I don't recall seeing anything appearing from Braga or uh, Natalie Grant Braga, but it may be there. I'm just not sure. If it's there, it could be you know, in, in a, uh, a classified setting. Next attendee question I have for you is, what were conditions in the Baltic like when Natalie Grant was there as a young woman working for the US? Well, that's a good question. I don't know those details and I wish I had them, uh, but she must have been very impressive because she was just a translator with the Hoover Relief Commission. And then somehow she migrated, uh, I think through and with the help and blessing of the Hoover Relief Commission, to the US legation in Riga, Latvia. The details of how she eventually became a uh, uh, State Department for Foreign Service officer is, is, I don't have them. She, she was not, it was difficult sometimes trying to probe her personal life. She, she didn't bristle, but she just evaded it. Uh, she considered that to be her personal life. But if you look at the fact that by, let's say the late 1950s, she accompanied, she was a State Department translator, a foreign service officer, accompanying the Khrushchev visit to the United States in 1957. So that said something. So she apparently impressed a lot of people in the meantime, uh, in the period from uh, when she was a uh, hired translator from the Hoover Relief Commission, with the Hoover Relief Commission, to her becoming a foreign service officer. But she was an impressive lady. Anyone who ever met Natalie for the first time walked away saying, wow, that's the kind of woman she was. Have Natalie or Richard been given any awards, et cetera, either here or overseas? I kind of suspect that there are things uh, with the current Polish government from the Polish government in exile in London. Um, 
I also suspect that there may be some recognition in the intelligence services of France and Great Britain. Uh, remember, I had mentioned earlier in my presentation that uh, he was taking there, taken there by the counterintelligence staff to brief their respective intelligence schools, intelligence academies, on how the Soviets operated. And his special charge was to talk about provocation and deception. In fact, I have a few of his papers on that and on, on those presentations. So usually when foreign intelligence services are, get courtesy visits for somebody to help them out, they will recognize them. I, I've worked for years with Brits and, and you know, I have a, a vanity wall with, with some of the recognition that I got from them. So I'm sure that they got recognition. If they didn't, they should have. Thank you. And just with the limited time, we'll take one more question. And I think this is a good closing question for you this evening. Uh, one of the attendees asks, I'd be interested in the speaker's opinion of what lessons from the book remain most relevant today. Oh, okay. Uh, that's, that's a good question. You know, and uh, there's a certain irony here because Natalie and a number of us in the intelligence community who knew her, who worked hard over the years on deception and, and what really broke everything open was the, was what was called the decade of the spy. That was the 1980s when so many cases became publicized. And then it couldn't be ignored anymore. I was on a, an interagency group um, that was told to go into operation by the White House, by the NSC. And we had to do damage assessment on all these cases. And one of our charges was to determine whether these cases were meant to feed deception and disinformation. The arguments that went on were bloody. And however, at the end of the day, at the end of the decade, that organization was created, the FDDC, the Foreign Denial and Deception Committee, with whom I worked for many, many years. Not only while I was still in DIA, but after I retired and started my consulting business, where I did a lot of work with them and for them. And we still faced opposition. Right up to the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was denial, but you know, deception, deception could occur at the tactical level was the mantra, but at the strategic level, no, no, we're too good for that. Basically, that's what it came down to. Now, I don't intend to get into contemporary domestic politics, but what I find very interesting is that all of a sudden, after 2016, now the Russians do deception, right? And my when I say the irony of all of this, my take on that is, where have you guys been throughout the whole Cold War? And, um, but my point is that the Soviets and now the Russians were not the only ones doing this. The Russians, by comparison, the Soviets, by comparison with the Chinese today, were pikers. The Soviets paid their penetrations, the penetration agents, peanuts by comparison with the money that the Chinese have. Okay, so think about that. These were the people who, uh, in the dawn of history or recorded history, knew how to do deception and disinformation and, and true counterintelligence in the perspective of controlling the opposition and then using your penetrations into the opposition to control them and into your international components, opponents to affect their foreign policy. So I would say use this as a charter set of case studies for how it's done and pick it up from there. Great. Well, thank you. That is all the time that we have this evening. I would like to thank Dr. Ziak for joining us and all of you who tuned in here on Zoom and Facebook for the Herb Romerstein Memorial Lecture. If you're interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you, Hannah. Thank everyone as well.